Welcome everybody to session five. I'm very glad to see so many of you. So it's been a long, exhausting day, but of course you uh, know that there are much more, many more exciting talks to come. So sure, you don't want to miss out on this. Um, I'm Anne-Sophie Meinke. I'm a philosopher based at the University of Vienna, specializing in metaphysics, philosophy of life sciences, and some other fields. And I'm a colleague of uh, Christoph and Astrid in the Young Academy, and I'm really pleased to be able to chair this session. First, I have to make a bit sad announcement. That's that the artist Thomas Feuerstein had to cancel his talk due to health. Uh, well, he's got a cold and he actually he doesn't have any voice, so that means he also can't do it via Zoom. Um, that means that we've got a bit more time for the individual talks, so up to five minutes more, perhaps, and not more than that. Um, yeah, so you've probably noticed that there is a logic in this program. So we started off with bodies, we moved on uh, to the brain, and now we are an even lower level of organization looking at cells. And our first speaker is going to be Elia, Eli Tanaka. Uh, she's a senior group leader at the Research Institute of Molecular Pathology. And I think she, ha she has a soft spot for salamanders and their amazing abilities to regrow re uh, limbs and also the spinal cord. And now the floor is yours. Okay. Uh yeah, well, thank you for um, inviting me to speak at this uh, super interesting conference. Um, it's been really great to make contacts um, to people in these fields. Um, so um, I will talk about a natural way in which we can um, uh, generate, uh, solve the problem of an amputated limb, let's say. So, um, well, in, in nature, animals have all sorts of different forms, and so there are plenty of animals that can do things that we're not able to do. And perhaps one of the most striking um, that's relevant for today is the animal that I work on, which is a salamander. Um, this is Ambistoma mexicanum here, and this is a time-lapse movie of a salamander where the limb has been amputated, and now over the course of a number of weeks, it's growing back. And so we've been studying um, how this animal uh, uses uh, stem cells in order to regrow uh, the limb, and not only regrow the limb, but to regrow the correct form. So when you amputate in the upper arm, you regenerate the elbow and the hand, and also you generate the right number of digits, for example. So can we learn the principles of regeneration from such an animal? And of course, everybody's asking, can we apply those principles uh, to perhaps engineering biological limbs for regeneration in humans. Now, um, one of the most important experiments that informs us on how to regenerate the correct form is uh, an interesting grafting experiment that was done a number of years ago uh, where um, the limb was amputated on the right side, and then this growing tissue called the blastema was transplanted to the other side. Uh, and then when this transplanted uh, tissue grew, it grew not only one limb, but three limbs, the normal limb plus two additional ones. And through a lot of thought, people hypothesized that cells in, the, in this front part that we call anterior is blue, and the cells in the back part uh, that we call posterior that are red must be a bit different from each other. So they hypothesized that when you transplant this blastema from um, left to right, then you're generating two additional interfaces uh, between blue and red cells. And it's the coming together of these blue and red cells that tells the limb, make a new limb here. And so one of our quests to understand limb regeneration was to understand what is this blue and red information that tells a limb to grow. Now, um, so I'm gonna, because of the short time, unfortunately I, I, I skipped a lot of slides, but through the work of, uh, for example, uh, Tatsuya Endo, Gardner, and Bryant, 
um, they could show the minimal essential tissue requirements for forming a new limb in an ectopic place. And so for many years, it was known that uh, nerves are absolutely required for limb regeneration. If you, if you remove nerves from the limb, the limb does not regenerate. So endo then deviated a nerve to the side of the limb, and uh, this would be enough to generate a few stem cells here, but an entire limb would not grow. But now he put together cell, uh, the blue cells from the back um, in, into this place to generate an ectopic interface between blue and uh, posterior and red anterior cells. And just by deviating nerve and transplanting this patch of cells from the other side of the limb, an entire limb grew. And so this is an example of one of these ectopic limbs that Leo Otsuki in my lab has generated through this type of method. So, um, so this says that um, this kind of, uh, as ag again, that this uh, anterior and posterior skin interface is extremely important for regeneration. And um, what we've come to know from studies in my lab, and I'll describe, in fact, some of these studies that came to uh, these results, is that this, um, this requirement for red and blue cells uh, depends on the fibroblasts, which in your limb normally would form scar tissue after a limb amputation. These cells, um, the, uh, they, they lose their differentiated properties, and instead of making a scar, they make stem cells. And then the stem cells in the posterior part of the limb turn on a molecule called sonic hedgehog, and the cells in the anterior part of the limb turn on a molecule called FGF8. And these are molecules that are released from cells, so these cells produce it, but this molecule is, uh, is, uh, uh, diffuses over to this other side, and vice versa, the FGF8 molecule here diffuses to cells on this side. And these cells become addicted to the signals from the other cells. So these anterior cells um, require or are addicted to sonic hedgehog signal coming from these cells in order to keep growing and complete limb regeneration. And then these cells on this side are addicted to the FGF8 that's being released by these cells in order to keep growing and make the, uh, your pinky and, and ring finger digits. And so this is why you need these two cell populations um, in the blastema in order for this limb to keep growing and regenerate. So if you look at the, if you would cut the limb and then look at it end on, in essence, I'm just showing you this system again. Uh, where um, you have sonic hedgehog uh, produced in the posterior cells and FGF8 in the anterior cells, and then these anterior cells need sonic, and then these posterior cells need FGF8. So what that means is since we identified these molecules, FGF8 and sonic hedgehog, as being these key molecules for allowing a limb to grow, we can uh, generate situations where a single molecule, adding a single molecule to um, uh, uh, an animal can cause an entire limb to form. And so um, what Yuji Naku and, and Elena Gromberg did, which actually are the experiments that led us to these conclusions, is that they deviated the nerve to the side uh, part of the limb, and then um, instead of transplanting a piece of posterior skin to the anterior side, they asked, what kind of drug can I add to these animals so that a limb will grow out? Can I add a single drug to these animals so that a limb will grow out? And they guessed that this should be a drug that stimulates the sonic hedgehog pathway. And so here's the control. This is a limb where uh, the nerve has been uh, deviated here, and it's, uh, and it's causing a zone of stem cells to grow here. So you see this bump, and those, that bump is full of stem cells. But this bump goes away by three weeks, um, and then nothing happens to the limb here. But now, in contrast, um, Elena and, and Eugene deviated the nerve to the side of the limb, and they bathed the animal, the entire animal, in a chemical that stimulates the sonic hedgehog signaling pathway. And so now you, you see here um, the sonic, uh, the bump, and then the bump, instead of going away, starts growing. It starts growing more, and then by 34 days, you have an entire limb that's grown on the side of this limb. 
Now, I want to talk about one other example where an entire limb, uh, an, one molecule can basically cause an entire limb to form. So this is a very old experiment from the 1980s. Uh, uh, where Naxian succina and then um, uh, replicated by Maiden showed that you can inject vitamin A derivative, retinoic acid, into an animal and get an entire limb to form. So the experiment that they've done here is to amputate the arm at the wrist level and then it normally, the salamander normally regenerates a hand. But in contrast, if you start um, injecting the animal with more and more retinoic acid, then you can regenerate an entire limb here um, out of the wrist. So instead of regenerating a hand, you regenerate an entire arm. And in our lab, we could show that this, um, here's, here's our, in our own lab where we generated this entire arm growing out of a hand, an amputation at the hand. And we could show that, um, that um, blocking the action of a single trans, uh, pr production of a single transcription factor, uh, MIS, was sufficient to block this uh, effect and allow a normal limb to grow. So in essence, we've defined um, the molecular pathways that can um, uh, take a dedifferentiated fibroblast uh, to form entire uh, limbs. Okay, so it seems like, uh, and, and uh, what I should say is that these molecules that we've identified that can uh, induce the limb to regenerate are exactly the molecules that people identified studying um, the limb development of mice, of chickens. And so these are universal molecules found in all vertebrate animals that can cause a limb to form. And the axolotl is able to turn these molecules back on in stem cells and then get an entire limb to form. And so that's the remarkable aspect of, um, of the axolotl. So then one can imagine when you have an amputated human limb, if you could make a bunch of stem cells at the, at the amputated site that have FGF, sonic, and retinoic acid, then maybe you would be able to get um, human stem cells to make a limb. Will that be possible? So one thing that we're uh, investigating with respect to that kind of in engineering feat is, um, is size. So when a limb forms in an embryo, the embryo is, is very, very tiny. And so this little zone of stem cells that makes the entire limb is very, very small. It starts making a small limb, and this limb grows over size. What's impressive also about the axolotl is that an adult axolotl can get its limb amputated. It forms a big zone of stem cells, and that big zone of stem cells regenerates a large sized limb. And so we, we think that the axolotl is also a very good model for understanding how can we implement these things that normally are working at very, very small scales in embryos in larger scale um, sets, uh, groups of cells and tissues. And so this is the challenge of size. So for example, Pietro uh, Tardivo in my lab is comparing how you form a limb in a tiny animal compared to a fully grown um, axolotl limb. What does that mean in terms of the number of stem cells that are used? And what does that mean in terms of the communication of this sonic hedgehog and FGF8 signal from the two sides of the, of the blastema? So what, for, in essence, what we're saying is in a small animal, What's the size of the sonic hedgehog zone? And then how far does it signal? And so patched is an indicator for how far the sonic hedgehog molecule is spreading across to the other side of the blastema. So in a big animal, does sonic is the sonic hedgehog signaling zone bigger? And then can it signal over a longer period of time? And this is fascinating for us as scientists because Presumably, the sonic hedgehog is the same molecule. It's the same, has the same molecular weight, and um, the animal has the same genetics. And we normally think of molecules as diffusing through space, and this is uh, limited by the size of the, of the protein. So how can it be that sonic hedgehog in a big animal can travel farther than in a small animal? And so this is just shows you a little bit what we're looking at here. So this is the growing um, stem cell zone of a, of a, of a young uh, developing axolotl. And this purple color is um, the, the spreading zone of the sonic hedgehog signal. 
And so you can see that in a bigger animal, this is like a teenage axolotl, the spreading zone of the sonic hedgehog signal is indeed much bigger in a bigger animal compared to a small animal. And at the moment, we're trying to understand how is it that in a big animal, sonic hedgehog can spread um, further. And so we think this is going to be important for engineering adult uh, size um, tissues. But this is in an axolotl, but, I, but here now I'm going to illustrate the challenge for doing it in humans, <laughs> which is that, OK, this is the size, let's say, of an axolotl developing stem cell zone. But now, if we go to this <laughs> slide, it's, uh, since the lights aren't down, I can't even see the thing. But the human limb bud is somewhere here. So the size of the human developing limb is, uh, oh, maybe, is, is it this thing? I think it's this tiny little thing. And then the size of, of uh, the diameter of an adult limb that we would have to regenerate from stem cells in a human would go from way beyond um, the size of the screen. And so we have to think about ways in which we can cause cells to communicate over extremely large distances if we're going to engineer um, human-sized tissues on, a, on an adult human, um, for example. And um, you can think, OK, well, maybe we just flood. You know, We can use engineering techniques to expose all the cells to sonic hedgehog signaling. We even have a drug uh, that efficiently can cause cells to turn on the sonic hedgehog um, signaling response. But, what I want, but there are kind of limitations to the way biological circuits um, uh, work. So this is, um, so I hope I can illustrate what I mean here. So, um, this is a shape of a normal mouse limb, and you can see it has five digits. And this is during development. This is an indicator of the five forming digits. Okay, so then what happens if in, uh, we just, um, if we just uh, instead of having sonic hedgehog only in this posterior side, we kind of flood the whole system um, with sonic hedgehog so that you have a lot of it. Oh, okay, so this is, in this case, they removed sonic hedgehog from the system, and indeed, you don't get any digits. So um, the sonic hedgehog signaling is super important for um, uh, forming a limb. But now, with a genetic trick, if you expose the entire forming limb to a lot of sonic hedgehog, you get a bigger limb bud, but you get lots and lots of digits. You get limb malformation. And this is because the size scale at which the digits is forming is still at a small scale, and you're increasing the size of the tissue, but the, but the zones for forming the, um, the new digits are not scaling corresponding to the bigger zone. Rather, you get more digits. So we have many aspects to learn about how uh, the axolotl is able to scale not only the signaling, the sonic hedgehog signaling within the limb bud, but in a large, um, in a large blastema, in an adult-sized axolotl, why is it that you get exactly five digits and not more digits um, like in, in this case? So I think that the axolotl is a very valuable system for us to learn how biology has coped with the engineering challenge of generating limbs at very different spatial scales. So I'm going to stop here and thank my lab, uh, which is an amazing lab full of enthusiastic scientists and really trying to solve this problem of how to generate adult-sized limbs. Thank you very much.